Good evening, everyone. My name is Charles Roberts. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's clinical webcast, Optimizing Scleral Lens Fitting with Scleral Topography. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that you have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter questions. Feel free to type in your questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we'll have some time to discuss them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Ken Mailer. Dr. Mailer earned his doctorate from the Illinois College of Optometry and is currently in private practice in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. His practice is devoted to orthokeratology as well as providing visual resolution for the irregular cornea. He's one of the foremost wave contact lens designers in the world and authored the first wave contact lens designer certification program. Dr. Mailer lectures extensively on custom contact lens design as well as providing clinical consultation services. Dr. Miller was also one of the first practitioners using the Penicam Corneal Scleral Profile, or CSP software, since its first unreleased beta version nearly two years ago. He is a fellow in the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow in the International Academy of Orthokeratology, a diplomat in the American Board of Optometry, and a fellow in the Scleral Lens Society. It's an honor to have Dr. Miller with us on tonight's webcast. And on behalf of Oculus, I'd like to express our gratitude for his time and efforts. I'd also like to thank everybody in attendance for their time tonight as well. So now, without further delay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ken Mailer. Hello to all of you out there. Uh, this is Ken Mailer, and uh, tonight we're gonna be talking about the uh, Penicam CSP software and how that can really be utilized to aid in um, uh, making the uh, scleral lens fitting much more efficient in your office and uh, getting to uh, both a more complex product that will perform better and in a faster fashion. Okay, we're just going to move right on here into the first slide as soon as I figure out how to get that clicking. Uh, just as a uh, disclosure slide, this is part of the uh, webcast tonight, uh, but I am not paid by wave. Uh, I am in solo private practice. I'm one of the uh, grunt guys out there doing the work and seeing patients uh, every day. Um, I also uh, do help uh, wave users out there as well as non-wave users out there on a private uh, consultation uh, service basis. Uh, I also was a beta tester for the uh, Wave software over all the years, and I have had some developmental input into the software. Uh, and uh, as Charles had mentioned, I did author the uh, first Wave Designers uh, certification program. Now let's get into the uh, Pentacam and what is it? Uh, I'm sure some of you out there uh, do have Pentacams, but some of you do not. And so this is kind of a uh, introduction to Pentacam and what, what can we do with this and uh, how can we uh, utilize the CSP and bring all this stuff together for uh, our scleral lens fitting. So what the Pentacam is, is a uh, rotating shine flute camera. Uh, it's a camera that rotates around. If you're taking a look at the picture down there at the uh, bottom three units, uh, there are the uh, basic unit, the AXL unit, and the HR unit. Uh, they each have different uh, certain different hardware functions, as well as they also have different software packages that are contained uh, within them. So there are some differences between each of the units, but all the units do have in common that they rotate around while uh, taking optical slices through the eye uh, and then uh, processing all of that into some sort of uh, information manipulation that we can then see on the screen. Uh, it does do corneal topography, so it does do surface uh, measurements. Uh, this is not a uh, Placido disc-based uh, topographer. Uh, this is taking actual uh, optical pictures, and as such, it has a very, very important uh, advantage over many of the other topographical units in that it isn't really reliant on tear film quality uh, or quantity. Uh, in fact, even if there were no tear film, you would still be able to get your images. Uh, and so that is actually incredibly helpful, and it really does come in very, very handy, uh, certainly in getting the uh, scleral lens data that we're looking for. Uh, it does tomography where it's actually cutting through the uh, cornea in an optical fashion. And so we can actually see those images uh, in cross section uh, of, the, um, of the cornea. We can go back further in through the anterior chamber, uh, right to the iris, uh, and even into the lens. If you have a nice dilated pupil, you can actually get uh, well behind the, uh, the iris here with the uh, with the uh, photographs. Uh, it really images the entire anterior segment. Uh, 
Uh, you can see in the uh, picture in the upper right there, uh, it basically sits on a table. The patient sits there uh, just like he would in, uh, for example, a slit lamp. And then you have the uh, software screen right to the uh, right of all that. And then you can uh, uh, take your pictures and process all of that. Now, for the purpose of this webinar, and hopefully some of you are still ushering in there, uh, please don't wait for the end to submit the questions. Uh, it will be very, very uh, efficient if you guys can, as the um, lecture is proceeding, to submit your questions uh, to the uh, organizer, Charles, and then he can get all those together so that once I'm done with this, we can answer those uh, one right after another, and hopefully we can get to them all. Okay. Well, here is the uh, corneal scleral profile, the CSP software. And basically that is a software package that's added on to uh, both the HR unit and the basic unit. At this point, the AXL unit is not compatible with the uh, CSP. Um, and as far as I know, uh, that's actually not even gonna be coming on the horizon. Uh, don't quote me on that uh, as I'm not in product development, but I do understand that there are some significant technical difficulties in getting the AXL hardware compatible with the CSP software. Uh, the basic unit is in fact the one that I have and it is more than adequate for scleral lens uh, fitting. Uh, the HR unit is a high resolution unit and although I have not personally used that for the docs who have used that and use the CSP software, they've told me that it's because of the high resolution and all of the uh, additional information that it's uh, capturing, uh, the CSP software does run quite a bit slower on the HR. So if you're thinking about purchasing a unit, uh, understand that the basic unit is absolutely adequate for running the CSP uh, for scleral lens fitting. Anyhow, I do understand my uh, pointer is visible on your screens, and so I just want to sort of divide up this screen so you can get a sense of what we're actually looking at. On the left half of this screen, we can see all these colorful arcs and there's 25 of them. And they're also divided up into five colors. The central uh, portion of these arcs are gray. Uh, the upper left is red, the upper right is green, uh, lower left is blue, and the lower right is a uh, violet or a purple color. And they actually correspond to this uh, same overall capture map here that's on the upper right of this screen. Uh, these colors are color coding the actual zones. Gray is always the cornea. The uh, green always refers to the superior quadrant. The red always refers to the inferior quadrant. The blue and the uh, violet or the uh, purple, however, uh, do change depending whether it's a right or a left eye. Uh, in this particular eye, we can see that the, um, uh, the blue here has an N in it, so that's the nasal side. Uh, and then on the um, uh, purple side, we have a T for a temporal side. Now, the actual images that it captured are over here on the right-hand side of the screen. This is the straight-on uh, view. The other views over here, this here is the uh, cross-section right through the uh, central portion of the cornea. And what you can see here is as you get to the limbus, right up over here, it's kind of bright and washed out. And so what the Pentacam has to do is when it's uh, doing a capture of the uh, scleral structures, you can see down here in the lower portion, it actually attenuates the actual imaging so it's not washed out and it can then detect the edge so it can figure out exactly uh, where in space the uh, profile of the sclera is. Uh, here's the uh, two extremes of the uh, same picture that's up over here on the top. Uh, as far as these arcs go, you'll notice there's this one red one that just happens to be the one that's selected here. It's uh, section number 19, and you can see it's the horizontal, the uh, uh, across the 177 meridian here. But each one of these arcs are actually being represented over here in this uh, scale on the left. And so you can see any cross section that you would like, and you can certainly move that up or down if you're interested in any particular arc, and you'll see how that comes into play in just a moment. Now, moving on over here, we see a larger version of that coverage map. And what this is, is it's telling you how decent a job you've done of actually capturing the data. Here you can see the central roughly 12 um, uh, millimeters here across is the corneal uh, 
uh, structure. Here's superior quadrant and the respective quadrants here. And you can see even at the 16 millimeter ring on the nasal side, we've actually gotten quite a bit further out than even the 16, probably it was 17 and change or so. Over here on the right hand side, uh, this is an elevation uh, map. And because the sclera is uh, uh, considerably flatter than the uh, cornea, what the software will do is it puts up the uh, best fit sphere up here at the top. Uh, in this case for the cornea, use an 8.30 millimeter uh, radius as the best fit sphere, and then referenced all of these uh, elevation points off of that sphere. And then for the sclera, we now have a radius of 10.5, of course, which is considerably flatter, so that we can then display the elevation differences uh, in this outer ring up over here. The uh, scale of the uh, colors is certainly represented up over here, so you can get a sense of um, you know, how elevated or depressed any particular areas might, might be. Okay, moving on. Uh, up in the upper left here, we can see um, a CSP captured screen. It's, it's covered a little bit by this, but that's not really important. The reason I put this screen up here is you see that the superior and the inferior are missing an enormous amount of data. This is an example of a bad coverage map. And this is an example of exactly the problems I had in the early days in using the uh, CSP software. Uh, devising a strategy to be able to get the uh, patient's lids out of the way is paramount to getting uh, good captures and good data. And it does take a um, a bit of uh, training on whoever's going to be doing these scans uh, so that good captures are done all the time. You can see here as it processed the data on that screen, it's missing an, an enormous amount over here, and it wasn't even able to process the information here for the elevation of both the uh, cornea and the sclera. The bottom portion over here, this represents one of my more current captures and it's a good capture map and you can see it's very very full and robust i i'm not really missing a lot of data whatsoever and you can see the coverage map does indicate that i was able to get very very good data and as a result we can then see uh, all the reference elevation data both on the cornea and the sclera okay moving on here so here are the 25 uh, profile arcs that it makes uh, through uh, each of the meridians as it's spinning around and doing its captures. And on that particular screen, you can click on that screen anywhere you like, and you will get a mouse over that shows you all of the unique elevations at that particular cross section. So here I did at a uh, 14 millimeter cord. Uh, down over here, you can see it's five, six, seven. So this is seven millimeters from the uh, center line. So it's at a 14 millimeter cord. And here are all the data points that it, it captured at that. I've just blown that up over here so you can see what that looks like. And we can see here at the uh, superior end, we have a um, sagittal micron value of 3,361. And as that's going through the superior, you can see that it's actually changing. Uh, up to about 3611 or so over here. And I clicked a little bit further right down here into the temporal. And we can see at its extreme, we're at about 3674 uh, microns. And this is at a 14 millimeter cord. So you have all of the unique respective sagittal depths at that one particular cross section, 14 millimeter cord. And that is uh, both from the superior over to the temporal edge. Of course, you can do this anywhere on this screen and you would have all of that data. Uh, if you're a real number cruncher, this is right up your alley. You can really enjoy yourself in seeing all of the different values uh, that are over there. Now, we also have this display screen. And what the display screen does is you can see at a given value here, we have it at 15 millimeters. Uh, at that particular cord, the uh, CSP software has gone ahead and given us a, uh, an output, uh, both of the uh, principal meridians, as well as the actual sagittal depths along those principal meridians at the cord of 15 millimeters. And I've just blown that up over here into a table. And so you can see here, what we have here in the superior is 38, uh, 3,800, uh, temporal is 3,900, inferior is 4,200, and nail is 3,800 uh, microns. It also does give you in the left-hand side, the actual slope or the angle 
uh, that at that instantaneous uh, point that the uh, sclera is actually changing at. So this gives you a sense of how steep things are or how flat they are uh, right at that particular chord. Now you do have the ability to change this value, this ring diameter. And so what I've done here is at 16.3, I've done the exact same exercise and we can see we get very, very different data. Uh, there aren't anything in the 30, uh, 3000 micron range. Everything is above 4000 now. And there's still quite a bit of variability going through the various quadrants. Over here, you can see at the extremes, there's a difference of about 378 microns with a difference of about a five degree on the slope. And then over here on the 16.3, we have 532 microns of difference between the extremes. And additionally, the uh, angle has changed as well. We now have an angle or slope angle of eight degrees. And so what that's telling you is, is that even in just going that 1.3 millimeter further on the cord uh, diameter, we've actually encountered a significant amount of difference that's created in terms of sagittal depth, as well as the particular angles as well. Uh, it also outputs here down at the very bottom, you can see here an average at 17.1 because I was able to get data out to 17.1 and it's giving us an, agile, an average sagittal depth of 47.94. Now, one of the more interesting things uh, as I've continued to see more and more data come out of the CSP is notice here that the flat meridian here on the 15 millimeter uh, chord diameter uh, is at four degrees. But as we moved out to 16.3, the flat meridian is now at 16 degrees. And so if you think about regular toricity, we think of regular toricity as two principal meridians, and those are sort of locked in stone from right at the uh, central point to as far out as we would take the toricity. But when we take a look at scleral data, we can see here that it really doesn't follow that. You end up with a certain amount of toricity, for example, at one chord, you end up with more toricity at a different chord, and you can also have a different axis for that toricity as well. And so that does come into play very significantly for us when we're designing up these scleral lenses and understanding how that toricity uh, change or change in axis or change in the principal meridians may really start to create a problem for us. We can see here on the screen how the red and blue uh, principal meridians at the 16.3 is really oriented a little bit more counterclockwise than it was over at the uh, four degrees here at the 15 millimeter ring. All right, moving on. This is actually the much more interesting stuff uh, here. And what we have here is a sagittal map uh, matrix. And yeah, I know that doesn't really look very exciting. And that's because it's just too small to see. And so this is actually a spreadsheet. And I've gone ahead and I've blown up a little bit of that area. And I've blown it up a little bit further. So you can actually see that this is the actual scleral map matrix matrix of sagittal depth that are actually being output. They're being captured by the CSP software, and then they're being output into this particular matrix. And so I find that this information is considerably more uh, valuable because it doesn't get you mired down in minutia. Uh, and also it gives you a sense of the trends rather than any instantaneous specific point. Now, here's the first case. And these, these three cases are WAVE cases. And WAVE and the Pentacam CSP are really a marriage made in heaven. They're really a very, very nice melding of uh, two entirely different technologies because that matrix that we just saw on the previous screen with all of that sagittal uh, data that's collected and creates that, that uh, uh, matrix, that's actually all fed directly into the WAVE software. And it then creates a both corneal and scleral reference surface so that you now can design a lens from that. And so we're gonna see that as we move forward here on these uh, on this wave design um, uh, for these uh, three cases. So this first case, this one here is the right eye of a post LASIK. And I chose the right eye of all three cases uh, just, just to compare uh, right eyes across the board so we can see how things change. On this particular uh, post LASIK eye, uh, we have here at 15.9, that was the uh, furthest out that I was able to get uh, all of this output over here. And I just, 
uh, gone ahead and created this table so we can get a sense of uh, what the sagittal depths are at those respective areas. And we can even see here at a, a quarter 15.9, we're not really dealing with, is, is certainly not sphericity, but we're not really dealing with regular touricity either. Uh, we can see here that the, um, uh, along the zero and the 90 degree, uh, yeah, you're in the 4200 range or so, and those are pretty close to each other. But we can see here that down at the bottom, the inferior uh, quadrant here is quite a bit different at 4500. That's uh, it's about 300 microns uh, steeper uh, than it was up over here. And we can see that represented in the slope of the angle. Uh, and so that's not really regular touristy anymore. Anyway, as we uh, move forward, this is the wave screen. And what I did is I just put that up there and you can see the, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, wave is uh, going around uh, 360 degrees and showing the um, uh, shape of the um, lens and the lens reference to the uh, cornea and scleral shape uh, as, as it's rotating around. I've gone ahead and blown up down here at the bottom the actual lens sagittal depth that I use for this uh, particular lens. And we can see over here in the upper right, I've gone ahead and put the scleral parameters that were given to us by the uh, Pentacam CSP software. And my lens happens to be at 16 millimeters. So it's just about where the 15.9 uh, millimeter data was uh, reported. And we can see here that the sagittal depth of my 16 millimeter lens varies from 42 up to 4714 uh at the 90 and the 270 and of course the 4714 certainly represents the steepest area where we had that 4591 uh micron depth reported on the uh, csp software so that of course that makes sense now as we move forward here i've just gone ahead and uh, put up the data so that we can see how it compares first the raw data that was collected on the csp and then the lens data that i actually uh, collected directly from the WAVE software. And I just did a quick uh, subtraction here, lens minus the collected data, so we can see what the differences are. Uh, and I kept everything at 0, 90, 180, and 270, just, just for simplicity here. Uh, but we could see here that the lens is just a little bit steeper um, at the uh, zero mark. Uh, that would be on the, uh, on the nasal side. Uh, a little bit steeper on the uh, temporal and a little steeper on the inferior than the actual reported data. Uh, and it's just a touch flatter than the, um, uh, the superior uh, quadrant over here in terms of the lens. Now there's actually way more data, uh, but we would spend all day actually looking at the exact data. It's done much better directly at the wave screen. On case number two, this one was the right eye of a post-traumatic eye. Now, this, this was an eye that had um, a, uh, a piece of a um, something that flew off a grinding wheel that went through the uh, cornea and penetrated into the iris, tore the iris, knocked out the lens. Uh, fortunately, the retina was fine, uh, and I was able to give this particular gentleman uh, vision back again with the scleral lens. Uh, but interestingly, before he came to me, uh, several scleral lens attempts had been tried and he failed with every one of them because he wasn't able to tolerate any of them. And so I went ahead and I took the uh, CSP test uh, data on him and you see I did get good coverage up over here. And we can take a look at the scleral parameters at 15.3, uh, which is not even all that large, and take a look at the asymmetry that exists here. Again, down toward the bottom, we have this kind of uh, uh, outlying uh, 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 spot over here that tends to be very steep. If we go back to the arcs, if you just take a look at them qualitatively, you'll notice here that the reds look very compressed compared to the greens. And that's actually where the bottom of this particular eye happens to be very, very steep. We can see how much steeper everything is over here on these arcs versus the um, uh, the 180 uh, away from that, the superior uh, quadrant. Anyhow, at 15.3, even at this small uh, diameter, we still don't really have sphericity or regular tericity. Uh, out at 16.0, which is the uh, size of the lens that I use for this particular gentleman, uh, we had an average sagittal depth of 41.03. 
Uh, this was the actual lens that I had designed for him. And once again, I've just gone ahead and put up over here the uh, sagittal depths that were reported by the uh, CSP software. And over on the uh, uh, central column, we can see the actual semi-meridians that it's reporting at. And you can see these are kind of oblique. This is not sort of a straight up and down. That happens to have been where his principal meridian were. Now on the lens, uh, sagittal depth, you can see here it varies in the for, at the 45 degree uh, semi-meridian, 3616, and then 180 degrees away at 225, we're at 4540. That's nearly a millimeter difference in terms of sagittal depth. And now let's just think about that for a second. A millimeter difference in sagittal depth means that if in fact you were to take the average of, of this, which is somewhere around 41, 4200 microns in a spherical type of lens, you absolutely positively are going to be flying in the breeze at two and a, uh, 225, uh, that's semi-meridian, but you're also going to be digging in tremendously at 45. The other thing also is that even if you would try and do a toric periphery, once again, you're going to have this asymmetry come up and really get in the way. And I suspect that's exactly why he had such problems dealing with the scleral lens or the multiple scleral lens attempts that were tried prior to him to coming to see me. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is there is absolutely no reason to suspect why this particular gentleman has such an incredibly different sagittal depth at the 45-225 meridian, given that it was just a random act of trauma. It was the, this is not like a misshapen eye due to disease or, or, or some other process going on. And so this prior to his, this eye prior to the accident was a very normal, I, I wouldn't suspect anything unusual about it, yet we ended up with about a millimeter difference in sagittal depth at the flange on this lens. Okay, so over here, again, I just went ahead and put up a comparison over here. We can see over here, we can see at the 16 millimeters, it was about 4,100 on an average sagittal depth. Yet over here at the uh, down near toward the uh, bottom over here, you could see just how much steeper my lens really was at 4,700 uh, microns. And so this this really was it was a very nice case it was very successful he uh he thanked me profusely because it was the first time he was actually able to tolerate any lens on his eye all right going to case three this one here is a keratoconic and certainly anyone who's dealing with irregular cornea certainly has our share of keratoconus and once again if we take a look up on the arc screen over on the left hand side again we can see the inferior portion over here it looks much much steeper than it does over in the superior portion and for that matter, any of the other quadrants as well. This uh, temporal one seems to be uh, getting a little steep down up over here, and certainly a lot different than what was going on uh, over here on the nasal side. Uh, nasal side's clearly a lot more elevated than the, uh, than the temporal side. Anyway, taking a look at this, once again, we have this sort of oblique uh, axes for the principal meridia. Uh, they're exactly at 45 and 135. And Although it's 16 millimeters, we have an average of about 4,300 microns. We can see once again down at the bottom at two and a quarter, uh, we have 4,670. Uh, it's again another 300 microns of um, uh, sagittal depth that's occurring down in that one particular area. Uh, and of course, on this screen, we can we can actually see the uh, where the cone is on this particular eye. And you'll notice also my coverage map looks very, very good. And this is just owing to more and more practice in getting maps. This was one of the uh, later maps that were done in the series of three cases that were presented. If we take a look over at the uh, WAVE software uh, and the, um, and the uh, lens that I had done for uh, this particular keratoconic, uh, once again, we can see all of that asymmetry up over here at 16 millimeters. We take a look at the lens. The lens goes from 3867 to 4618. That's about three quarters of a millimeter of sagittal depth difference at the 16 millimeter cord. So, and again, this is at an oblique axis. So it's not even straight up and down. Moving right along up over here, I just compared up the scleral uh, parameters that were reported 
by the uh, Pentacam up against the uh, lens parameters here and a little bit of a summation. You can see that there's not really a direct one-to-one um, -one relationship. Uh, there are certain fitting things that I did to change uh, the way uh, the lens actually landed, but the actual trends, uh, the flattest and the steepest, that still certainly um, is, is upheld uh, through the design. So on this here, this is a summary si slide of the three cases. And I think it's very, very interesting to point this out uh, to anyone who's fitting scleral lenses on these irregular eyes. The first case is a post-LASIK. The second one is a post-trauma. There's absolutely no reason to believe that either of these two eyes should have anything unusual going on on their scleras because there isn't any natural disease process that might have uh, misshapen the scleras in any way. The third case, the keratoconus case, one can argue that maybe there's an underlying uh, structural difference in keratoconic eyes. And so perhaps uh, scleral lens shapes uh, may be a little bit more bizarre or more asymmetric in terms of keratoconic eyes. But certainly the first two don't really fall into that. The, tra the traumatic eye, uh, that actually was a 2020 uncorrected eye prior to the trauma. So there was nothing really unusual about that eye. Uh, the post LASIK, that was a very healthy eye as well prior to the LASIK problems that were introduced through the uh, surgical intervention. Uh, what I did here is I took at a 15 millimeter cord and I reported out the sagittal depths for each one of these eyes. The, I highlighted the flat um, at the, uh, with the blue bars and I highlighted the steep uh, semi-meridian uh, with the red bar. And the first thing that you can see is, and I also put up the, uh, the actual um, uh, principal meridian picture that was drawn by the um, uh, CSP software. And you can see here at 15 millimeters, there's actually no correlation between any of these eyes whatsoever. Furthermore, if you take a look at the flat meridian, here you have the flat meridian at 11 degrees. Here you have the flat meridian at 306 degrees. And here you have the flat meridian at 134 degrees. That's just about random. The steep meridian obviously is almost as random here from the 281. Here, 216 and 224, these are actually pretty close to each other, but there's no reason to believe why they would be. I think that just happens to be a random happenstance. Uh, if we take a look at the flat to steep sagittal depth difference, so the extremes at a core to 15 millimeters, the post LASIK eye has a difference of 260 microns. The traumatic eye has a 452 micron difference, and the keratoconic eye has a 385 micron difference. And so again, there's no reason to understand why this particular traumatic eye has the greatest uh, difference in terms of sagittal depths at a 15 millimeter cord. Uh, it just I, th I think that happens to be random, and it's just the way eyes are put together. Uh, down at the bottom here are the action in gray, are the lenses that are on each of these three patients. All the, all the three of these lenses are very successful on every one of them. We can take a look here. The 16 millimeter um, lens on the post LASIK patient has about a half a millimeter sagittal depth difference. The post traumatic eye has about a millimeter and the uh, keratoconic eye has about three quarters of a millimeter difference in sagittal depth from its extremes of the flattest to the steepest. So anyone who's been fitting scleral lenses and sometimes runs into that, you know, I think I've done everything right and you don't really or un, are unable to in the particular design that you're using to uh, generate a, um, a flange that has asymmetry. I think you can see by these three cases that don't really have anything to do with each other, why sometimes those cases just don't seem to really be, uh, uh, reach a success. Uh, you may be a little tight uh, in one area because you have regular toricity in the in the flange, uh, or it, maybe if you even have a spherical flange, and certainly that would create uh, these types of problems. So one of the nice things that I've been able to enjoy with the CSP software now for it's about a year and a half or so that I've been using it is it gives you a much much better feel for almost how arbitrary scleral lens shapes really can be. And they don't have anything to do with what's going on on the cornea. Uh, certainly we would have expected the keratoconic uh, cornea to really be 
probably the most bizarre over here. And we can see it's actually in between both the, uh, the post-LASIK and the post-traumatic eye uh, in terms of its scleral shape and its asymmetry, uh, as well as just how steep it really is. Okay, so just wrapping this up over here, because I do want to get to questions. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the Pentacam CSP software, WAVE, and the laboratory offerings. The CSP software uh, can really give you sagittal uh, data to a cord of 16 and a half to about 17 millimeters reliably. I will tell you, though, it does take practice to get the uh, uh, superior and the inferior lids out of the way uh, so that you can get good pictures. And I will tell you that the single best thing I did uh, is understand that this cannot be done by two hands. You absolutely need four hands to get good data. You do not need to do that for the central um, uh, corneal measurement, but once you start getting into the CSP and you have to get the superior and inferior lid out of the way, you absolutely need someone uh, to uh, be able to do the joystick and the capture, and then you need another set of hands to be able to control the patient's lid so that they're out of the way. Uh, the captured data can create a virtual model of the cornea and sclera within WAVE, and that's used as a reference surface to design the lens. And I think that's, it's absolutely wonderful to understand that if you can get this surface data in a very reliable way, unencumbered by tear film problems, and have this very, very um, resolution rich surface that has all of this uh, sagittal data that's been uh, presented, certainly in WAVE, as a surface 360 degrees around, you can now line up a lens any way you would like on that particular surface. Now, you can also read the captured data manually and use it as a guide for a fixed design. So for example, if you're not using WAVE, uh, you're using Laboratory X's offering, and they are you know, giving you uh, the, um, the ability to create a, a toric flange, as long as you know the sagittal depth of what is going on in that toric flange at a given chord, you can then go ahead and match that up to the output data from the CSP software uh, in that particular uh, semi-meridian so that you now have a flange that properly aligns uh, to that particular eye. What the CSP cannot do is it can't account for the spongy factor of the conjunctival tissue. Uh, I didn't really get into that into the wave screens when I was going through these three cases, but some lenses just settle more than others because some conjunctiva seems to be just a little bit spongier than others. And so it, even with all of this wonderful data, you might have a very, very nice overall relationship in terms of the flange alignment but you cannot predict exactly how far that lens is going to sink down into the conjunctiva. You have to assess that uh, either at the slit lamp or using OCT, uh, whatever your chosen uh, method is, but you have to assess that once the lens is on the eye. Having the sagittal measurements at virtually any cord up to 17 millimeters is certainly very, very helpful uh, for the clinician to design up a first lens that really does fit incredibly well. Uh, in fact, I pretty much had locked away all of my um, fitting sets that I've accumulated over, I don't know how many years, uh, because I already knew even once I got the first lens on, I would have to change at least the power or something about the lens because I was gonna see something I really didn't like. And what's happened now as a result of the CSP software is I've actually been contemplating now even putting a trial lens on just so I can get power, uh, at least a ballpark power, uh, for what I'm going to need for my scleral lens design because these first lenses that I'm getting that have been fit empirically directly off of the CSP software have been fitting really so wonderfully. And I would really like to see the, uh, you know, the patient be able to leave really with the first lens. Um, and it's really gotten to that stage now that in isolated cases here, I'm actually starting to put trial lenses on, which I haven't done in, in at least 15 years, just so I can get power so I have some idea of what I really need to put in terms of power onto that lens, that first empirically designed lens. That wraps up what I was uh, presenting today. Uh, any questions you'd like to go ahead and submit, by all means, go ahead and do so. I think we have a little over 20 minutes here that we can get to those. And I'm just gonna put up this splash screen for Oculus. All right, thank you, Dr. Maller, and for all of you in attendance, thank you for being here. Uh, we do have some questions, but just like Dr. Meller uh, 
mentioned, just to remind you, uh, on your GoToWebinar screen, you have a text box for typing in your questions. If you enter them now, I should have a chance to read them off for Dr. Meller before the, the webinar ends. If you missed part of tonight's webinar, you'll be receiving a link to the recording within 48 hours. And if you have any other questions about tonight's webinar, the Pentacam or the CSP report, you're welcome to contact us at the, the 800 number list on, listed on the screen, or you can email us at sales at oculususa.com. We also have prior webinars like the one tonight available on, on our website at www.oculususa.com. So without uh, further delay, I'll get to some of the questions. So our first question is, how is the scleral shape affected by cornea shape? Or, or is it affected by the cornea shape? As, as I pointed out, uh, the cornea and the sclera don't seem to have very much in common. Uh, Greg Denayer et al. had done a, um, a study, I think that was released within the last year, year and a half or so, something like that, on scleral shape. And he, uh, using the SMAP3D, went ahead and showed that Again, the, the scleral shape is actually considerably more asymmetric than we first thought. Even closer to the limbus, uh, it is much, much uh, more asymmetric. And I will absolutely concur 100% that since I've been using the CSP software to analyze scler scleral shapes, the cornea has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on on the sclera in terms of uh, cylinder, in terms of the axis of the cylinder, in terms of asymmetry, in terms of regulatoricity. You can have toric scleras with spherical corneas. You can have spherical scleras with toric corneas. You can have a totally asymmetric sclera and a perfectly normal cornea, such as the case number two that I presented. There was really nothing unusual about his cornea. The other cornea, I, obviously, I, I saw him after he had trauma to that, uh, to the right eye. But the left eye looked like a perfectly normal cornea. It, it was an uncorrected 2020 eye, uh, and in fact, he has uh, almost a millimeter of asymmetry going along uh, at that 16 millimeter cord on his sclera. Certainly, you wouldn't expect to see something like that. So, uh, the educational uh, value that I've received from analyzing all of these CSP uh, data maps that I've been collecting over the last year and a half or so has really uh, pounded into my head that regardless of what's going on on the cornea, it has nothing to do with what's going on on the sclera. And you really have to treat the sclera as a separate entity. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, our next question uh, would like you, she thinks you missed it, but would like you to repeat the definition of regular touristy. Regular tericity is where you have two principal uh, meridians at 90 degrees apart. Uh, regular tericity that we think of on a cornea, we think of two principal meridians. Uh, for example, if we prescribe out a pair of glasses to correct astigmatism, uh, you certainly don't prescribe multiple axes. Uh, if the prescription is, for example, minus three, minus one axis 90, what we're saying with that prescription is that the toricity on the cornea and, and, and of course what's being optically generated as a result of what's on the cornea is along 180 and 90 degree principal meridians. Yet on the sclera, you can have the, the meridians, for example, at 180 and 90, just like I just said, at a cord of 15 millimeters, yet they can be, for example, at 15 and 105 degrees at 16 millimeters, and they may even be further away at 17 millimeters. You may be looking at uh, at, at a cord of 15 millimeters, uh, tericity that is at 180 and 90, and you get out to 17 millimeters or even 18 millimeters, and you might be dealing with tericity at uh, 30 degrees and 120 degrees. Now, optically, obviously, that's no big deal, but in terms of fitting, that's an enormously big deal because where are you putting your toric flange and and again in wave i'm not i'm not bound to regular tericity like that regular astigmatism and so i can create tericity at 180 and 90 at a cord of 15 and then create maybe at 17 millimeters tericity of 30 degrees and 120 degrees in many of the pre uh the pre-designed sets or the uh, fitting kits or any any branded type of um, uh, scleral lens, I don't believe you have that type of flexibility. 
So that that can create that problem. And that's why I think sometimes, you know, you sit there and you did the exact same thing that you've done before using lens X or lens Y or lens Z. And this one particular eye is really giving you a hard time. Well, the, the, that the uh, difficulty may be because you don't have regular tericity out onto the uh, sclera. You may be dealing with a fair amount of asymmetry or you may be dealing with multiple axes out there and there's no easy way to address that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Our next question, uh, they're asking, is this uh, is a Pentacam CSP report for wave lenses only? Absolutely not. It has nothing to do with wave. It plays well with wave uh, and that's exactly why I put up the slide. I'm just gonna back up here on my slides. Let me just see if I can go back here. Let's sit back through here on the, actually the screen right here, this will do it. What you see here is at a cord of 16.3 millimeters, the CSP software is giving you outputs of what the sagittal depths are in each of the principal meridians at its edge. And so if you have, for example, lens X from whatever company, uh, it could be an Atlantis, a Zen lens, a Europa, it doesn't matter what the lens is. If you know what the uh, uh, flange uh, uh, tericity or, or sphericity, whatever the curves are, out at a specific cord, for example, let's say you're gonna fit a 16.3 millimeter lens, knowing from the CSP software that you have values here on the 16.3, superiorly at, at 4328, inferiorly at 4860, if you can then address that uh, with the um, particular offering from the laboratory, you can then do something about that particular quadrant uh, specificity and create a flange that's actually going to align much better. Uh, obviously, you're locked into the entire quadrant. Uh, the advantage that WAVE gives you is you're not locked into any particular quadrant whatsoever. And so I can do all of that a asymmetry 360 degrees around the lens. But don't, don't think for a minute that this would not help you, even if you were using, for example, a Zen lens and you just had all of this information. Because at the end of the day, what you really want is you want to know exactly where is the sclera in space. And if you knew that here on this particular eye at 16.3, both at the temporal quadrant and the nasal, nasal quadrant are at about a 4450, roughly. And superiorly and inferiorly, you have this difference of about 500 microns. If you can create that, that extra uh, sagittal depth inferiorly while creating this much lesser sagittal depth superiorly, you can have a very, very nice fitting lens up there. So it, it plays very well with WAVE, and I've really enjoyed the interaction of the two technologies, but don't feel for a second that you have to use WAVE with the CSP software. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question is, if you have less than a 300 micron difference on the cornea, can you use a corneal GP? Sure, absolutely. I do. I, I, even if I have more than 300 microns, I'll use a corneal GP. Um, the uh, data that the, uh, uh, the Pentacam gives you certainly does give you a lot of data on the cornea as well. Uh, I titled this particular lecture on scleral, so I really uh, kind of focused everything here on scleral lens uh, design and uh, technology. But as far as cornea lens fitting, absolutely positively, you can use this. Uh, you don't need the CSP software for that. You can just use the, uh, the general output that comes directly from the uh, central scan of the uh, Pentacam that's gonna give you data out pretty far. And then you can design up a cornea lens from that as well. Uh, as far as WAVE goes, again, it interacts very, very well with WAVE. And I've had a chance to design uh, many corneal lenses with the WAVE software using the CSP, and it, it's very, very reliable. It does a very, very nice job. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is, besides using a second set of hands, do you have any other tips, tips for acquiring better images, uh, especially with a superior scan? Uh, six, six months of trial and error? The answer is no. I tried every single way to do this uh, by myself. Um, and 
I absolutely positively was stymied no matter what I tried to be able to get really, really good scans. Uh, there's, it's, it's just a little too cumbersome. You can't really have the patient hold their upper lid because the lid, their hand is going to get in the way of the camera as it's rotating around and then you're going to miss an entire section of data because the hand is blocking the camera. Uh, if you're trying to get the patient to help you, uh, believe me when I say it's enough to get the patient to just concentrate on the central fixation target in the center and try not to blink. That's, that, that's already enough for the patient to deal with uh, while you're trying to get the scan. So I, I would strongly recommend don't even waste your time trying to do this by yourself. You must have another set of hands, uh, you know, another tech or something like that that can help you out. And it really, first of all, it alleviates the, uh, the problems in um, how long it takes to get the scans, as well as ultimately how good a scan you're going to get. And uh, yeah, it, it, six months I wasted time and I could not possibly get a decent scan by myself. And so when I finally resigned myself to another set of hands, that's when my scans really started getting fantastic. Okay, thank you. Our next question. If you have a scleral lens greater than 16.5 millimeters, uh, you generally need a, a toric periphery. Do you need that with smaller lenses as well? Well, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. I showed you tonight here uh, three eyes at a let me just go back here again. Here's a here's at a cord of 15 millimeters. So if you were going to fit a 15 millimeter lens on these three eyes, take a look at the differences of their sagittal depths. On on the post LASIK eye over here, we have what's that about 300 microns between the flat and the steep. On the post trauma eye, we have about Ooh, that's about 400, uh, 306, so yeah, a little over 400 microns of, of difference here. And on the keratoconic eye, we're at about, also about 400 microns of difference. If you think 400 microns, that's, that's four tenths of a millimeter sagittal height difference. And this is only at a cord of 15 millimeters. I think the days of, if you keep the lens less than 15 millimeters, you can get away with a spherical lens. And if you need to go to a larger lens than 15 millimeters, you need a toric periphery. I think those days are really starting to sail away from us as we're starting to get more and more um, understanding of what's really going on on the scleras. Uh, again, that's not to say you, you don't have successful patients. All I'm saying to you is that if you really take a look at the scleral data off of these eyes, eyes even at 15 millimeters don't really exhibit this symmetry that we think that they have. Here's three random eyes and they're ranging what, four 300 to 400 microns of toricity, and it's not necessarily even regular toricity. And so if you can address that in your design, I guarantee you will end up with a more successful case. So if you have a spherical design, maybe you've been successful, but if you would design and deal with this asymmetry, you will absolutely positively be more successful. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have several questions that uh, are basically asking, how does the CSP and the Pentacam compare with other scleral profilers? I think uh, the, the only two scleral profilers out there uh, against the uh, CSP would be the, um, uh, the ESP, uh, the Eaglet, and the uh, SMAP 3D. Um, and you're talking about three very different technologies. Uh, first, in terms of data acquisition, they're all very similar in terms of how much time uh, they take. Uh, and again, the problem is the lids of the patient. Uh, if, if the patient didn't have lids, this would all be very easy, but of course they do have lids, so we have to work around that. And getting the lids out of the picture is uh, critical to being able to get good scleral data. Uh, the Pentacam is different though from the uh, ESP and the SMAP3D in that it is not taking reflected data off the surface of the sclera, it's doing it through a camera. Uh, whereas both the ESP and the SMAP 3D require reflections off the surface. Excuse me one second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, the reflected data, uh, anyone who's done any uh, placido disc-based topography who, who is um, 
uh, reliant on reflected data already understands where that can create a problem uh, if you have tear film that is either inadequate uh, poor poor quality or it just has junk and debris floating by the other thing not to forget is that the um, uh, acquisition time getting the patient set up getting them to keep their eye open uh, this is not necessarily any trivial matter for the patient and tear films do start to break up and you're sitting there trying to get everything lined up that can be problematic that is the one thing that uh, I don't really worry about uh, getting the Pentacam data because it's not reliant on the tear film whatsoever so that is a a, a glaring difference uh, between the uh, two uh, the eaglet that does the um, uh, the two cameras to get the um, uh, uh, the uh, elevation data across the uh, measured distance. And then, of course, the uh, SMAP 3D does a stitching uh, model of three different captures, you know, the central, uh, straight across, superior and inferior. Uh, so you're talking about very, very different uh, technologies. Um, I've had a chance to see those, but I haven't personally worked with those. So I can't comment specifically on those. I can tell you, though, the fact that I don't have to deal with a tear film, that has been an incredible plus after all these years of dealing with topography uh, that does rely on tear film and seeing the problems that tear film problems create. Uh, certainly with scleral lens uh, designs, we absolutely positively are dealing with compromised tear films. And so, and again, this data acquisition definitely takes a little bit longer. I'm able to get both eyes uh, in their complete and good captures uh, out for the entire scleral data, probably about eight minutes now is about what it takes to uh, to gather that data. And I'm really actually pretty efficient. But think about how tough that is on an eye or a pair of eyes that has tear film problems and you're trying to capture data. Uh, I would imagine that that may uh, lengthen that out uh, considerably longer. I'll also point out that in my early days when I was trying to do this with only two hands, I spent as much as 25 minutes trying to get, and I still did not get good data. I just spent a lot of time. So uh, I've gotten that down to a, just about four minutes or so an eye uh, is about what it takes me. Uh, and that's with another set of hands helping me. So I would say that's an enormous plus. As far as the integration with how do we take all that data and then put it into a lens, I can't really speak for the other platforms. Uh, and again, for the Pentacam, I've really been using this extensively with Wave, and it's been absolutely fantastic in that it, you know, for that, that particular combination of technologies. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Uh, we have several questions that are asking what the average prescription or how you would decide, decide to use a scleral contact lens versus another type of contact lens? Uh, the two uh, real sort of lines in the sand that would get me over the edge to consider a scleral design is number one, uh, the study from uh, out of Pacific by Frank Zhang a couple of years ago showed that uh, Elevation differences on a cornea of 350 microns or less can be successful in a, a corneal design, uh, I think it was 88% of the time, and that, that's a pretty high success rate. Uh, the other thing is 350 microns of elevation differences between a peak and a valley on a cornea is actually pretty uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, if you go back and take a look at a lot of the cones that you see, you'll see a lot of the cones don't even quite get close to that type of elevation difference. Um, I personally, being able to design very asymmetric corneal lenses, don't even necessarily adhere to the 350. And I have actually had lenses on eyes with even greater elevation differences than that. But once I start getting up at that 350, maybe even 400 micron elevation difference on the cornea, that's where I really start to think, well, a corneal lens is not gonna be really uh, as stable as I want on here, and it's time to move to a scleral. Uh, the other place, the other line in the sand that would push me over into a scleral design absolutely positively is if I take a look at the tear film and I know that the tear film cannot support a corneal lens, uh, that they're going to constantly have a complaint about comfort or something like that because the tear film is just not adequate uh, or there's garbage in it or whatever like that, then, I, then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of move to a scleral uh, almost, almost like a knee-jerk response. Past that, I don't. it, it would be a case-by-case -case type of thing and there would be, have to be a very specific reason that I would go for a scleral versus a corneal lens. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I guess we only have time for about one more question. So 
I apologize to all the questions we didn't get to, but our last question is, can you replace the corneal topographer if you have a Pentacam? Uh, depending on the corneal topographer that you have, uh, I believe you probably could. Uh, you know, I've been using uh, Scout Topographer now for uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, it's a tried and true workhorse for me, and I still do use it. When I purchased the Pentacam, I had the intention of retiring the Scout. Um, I found that, no, I still end up taking uh, the corneal topography there, owing more to the database management of my wave lenses than, than really anything else. Uh, so I think the short answer is, is if you have a Pentacam, I think you probably can replace uh, the corneal topographer. Uh, you certainly can get all the data that you need for corneal topography that way as well. Do understand, though, it is not placido disc based and it does report through a very different methodology. So depending on your specific needs, that may or may not be as helpful as you want. For example, uh, Oculus has the Keratograph uh, 5M with the uh, dry eye package. Yeah, that works much better on a placido disc based type of system than it would on, on the Pentacam. So depending on what you're using the topographer for, uh, I think Yes, you could feel safe about replacing it, but depending on specific needs, it may or may not service everything you're looking to get out of it. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Maller. Uh, that's about all the time we have for questions tonight. So thank you, everybody, for sticking around. And I'd also like to thank everybody who did send in questions. Thank you again, Dr. Maller, for your excellent presentation and for all your added discussion there at the end. My pleasure. I hope everyone enjoyed it and learned a whole lot. And uh, I'll see you all, all of you guys soon. So this concludes tonight's presentation. So again, thank you everybody for attending and thank you, Dr. Maller. And on behalf of Oculus, I wish you all a good night.